There is a moment in every field of human endeavor when everything changes. A single data point that shouldn't be there. A single note that doesn't belong in the symphony. For the astronomers of the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System, ATLAS for short, that moment arrived not with a bang, but with a whisper. It was just a single pixel of light, one faint dot against an infinite black canvas, moving in a way it shouldn't. On July 1st, 2025, in a remote Chilean desert, an automated telescope designed to protect Earth from threats found something it wasn't looking for. Something from out there. This wasn't a rock from our backyard. This was a traveler. It wasn't circling our sun. It was cutting through our solar system like a bullet through a crowded room. They gave it a clumsy name, A11PL3Z, but soon the world would know it as 3I Atlas, the third known interstellar visitor. Its speed was the first clue, a blistering 137,000 miles per hour. To put that in perspective, that's fast enough to travel from the Earth to the moon in under two hours. This isn't just fast. This is a velocity that mocks our planetary conventions. This is the speed of an object that doesn't belong here. Think about that. For all of human history, we assumed the stars were fixed, distant, untouchable. Then, in 2017, Oumuamua, a strange cigar-shaped visitor that left us with more questions than answers. A crack in that paradigm. The second was Comet Borisov in 2019, a more familiar icy traveler, but no less an outsider. The crack widens. And now, 3I Atlas. This isn't a crack anymore. It's a door. And it's swinging wide open. We are living in a new reality. One where our solar system is not a secluded island, but a busy crossroads in a galactic highway. But this visitor is different. It's bigger, faster. And it arrived from a direction that has astronomers staring at their screens, not with panic, but with a deep, unsettling curiosity. It didn't arrive from the random void. Its trajectory points back, with unnerving precision, toward the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, toward the constellation of Sagittarius and the supermassive black hole that lurks there, Sagittarius A. It's as if the galaxy itself has sent a messenger, a ghost from the galactic core, now on our doorstep, carrying secrets from the very center of everything. In the days and weeks that followed its discovery, the world's great eyes turned toward the interloper. The Hubble Space Telescope, the ALMA array in Chile, the infrared gaze of Spitzer, all focused on that single pixel, desperate to resolve it into something tangible. To understand it. This was no longer astronomy. It was planetary forensics. And the first task was to build a profile of the suspect. The initial data was staggering. Its hyperbolic trajectory was off the charts with an orbital eccentricity of 6.2. To understand what that means, picture our solar system. Every planet, every asteroid, every comet bound to the sun follows an elliptical path. Earth's orbit is a near-perfect circle, an eccentricity of 0.01. A long-period comet might stretch out to 0.99. Three Atlas's value of 6.2 is so extreme it doesn't even belong on the same scale. It's the difference between a closed loop and a single decisive slash across the canvas of our system. It is, by definition, unbound. Then came the size estimates. Early radar observations and brightness readings suggested something colossal. A nucleus of 12, perhaps even 20 kilometers across. The mind reels at the implications. An object of that scale, moving at that velocity, carries energy measured in millions of megatons. It is a planet killer, delivered from another star. But later, more refined observations from Hubble revealed a complication. A massive, swirling coma of gas and dust. This halo made the object appear far larger and brighter than its solid core. The current best guess? A nucleus of less than a kilometer, shrouded in a cloak of its own evaporating material. This is where the mystery deepens from the merely extraordinary to the truly perplexing. 
This coma, this atmosphere of the object, began to behave strangely. Spectrographs confirmed the presence of water vapor, carbon dioxide, and cyanide gas, the classic fingerprints of a comet. But the way it was outgassing didn't fit the models. The activity seemed too intense for its distance from the sun, as if its internal engine was running hotter than expected. And then there was the light curve. As the object rotated, its brightness fluctuated. This is normal. What was abnormal was the degree of fluctuation. The changes were extreme, suggesting a highly irregular shape, perhaps elongated and tumbling, much like Oumuamua. But some researchers, like Harvard's Avi Loeb, looked at the data and saw something else. They argued the light signature wasn't just from reflected sunlight off a weirdly shaped rock. They posited that the nucleus itself might have a peculiar reflectivity or perhaps was even generating its own faint glow. Imagine that. Not just a rock reflecting a torchlight, but an object with a light bulb inside. This is the precise moment a scientific observation tips into a scientific thriller. We are no longer just measuring. We are interpreting. We are detectives at a crime scene, looking at a set of fingerprints that don't match any known suspect. The conservative explanation is that we are seeing a novel type of comet with a composition and structure forged in a stellar environment utterly alien to our own. Its chemical makeup is a recipe written around another star. The other explanation, the far more speculative one, hangs in the air like a charged particle. Could the anomalous properties, the strange outgassing, the peculiar light, be signs of something else? Could the coma be not just evaporating ice, but the venting of some internal process? Is it shielding something? The very vocabulary changes. It is no longer just a coma. It is a shroud. It is no longer just tumbling. It is maneuvering. This is the power of an anomaly. It forces us to question not just the object, but the very limits of our language and our imagination. The data is real. The anomalies are real. The interpretation, however, is a battleground. And on that battleground, the future of how we see our place in the universe will be decided. With the data collected, the scientific community did what it always does. It began to argue. The conservative position, led by researchers like Daryl Seligman, is built on a foundation of elegant parsimony. Their argument is methodical and compelling. Firstly, the object has a coma. It is outgassing volatiles. This is the definitive signature of a comet. To call it anything else, they argue, is to ignore the most obvious piece of evidence. Secondly, its trajectory, while hyperbolic, is perfectly consistent with natural gravitational mechanics. No unnatural course corrections have been detected. Thirdly, the light curve anomalies can be explained by a bizarre but natural morphology, a tumbling pancake-shaped nucleus of primordial ice and rock, perhaps sheared into its strange form by a cataclysmic event near its parent star billions of years ago. Their closing argument is simple. When you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, and certainly not unicorns. Then there is the other side, the case for the zebra. And its most famous lawyer is Harvard astrophysicist Avi Loeb. His argument is not built on what is seen, but on what isn't. The absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, he contends, but a challenge to look harder. He points to the anomalies the conservatives gloss over, the unusual ratio of non-gravitational acceleration, the subtle push from its own outgassing, is slightly off from standard comet models. The reflectivity spectrum, he argues, doesn't perfectly match any known material in our solar system. His most provocative hypothesis is that the object could be a light sail, a piece of alien technology, perhaps derelict, using the pressure of solar radiation for propulsion, which would account for its strange acceleration without the expected volume of outgassing. He assigns this possibility a 60% probability on his controversial lobe scale. The scientific establishment often meets this with derision. It's labeled sensationalism, not science. 
but to dismiss it outright is to miss its profound philosophical core. Loeb's argument is not really about this one object. It is a challenge to our entire scientific methodology. He forces a terrifying and exhilarating question. What if our search for extraterrestrial intelligence is flawed because we are only looking for what we expect to find? What if we are like fish in a pond, meticulously developing theories about the water and the rocks, while utterly oblivious to the concept of a fisherman on the shore, because we have never seen one? His work is a plea to include the concept of the fisherman in our scientific models. Let's be clear, this is a fringe view. Most astronomers roll their eyes. But here's why we must entertain it, even for a moment. Not because it's likely, but because it's a possibility. As Loeb says, to dismiss it outright is to operate in a stone age of space exploration. What if we're not the only ones looking up? What if we're not the only ones sending out probes? This is the true heart of the debate. It is a conflict between two types of courage. The courage to say, I will be patient, I will be methodical, and I will not be fooled by my own imagination. And the courage to say, I will dare to be fooled, because the cost of missing a discovery this profound is far greater than the cost of being wrong. And silently listening in on this grand debate, the Allen Telescope Array continues its work. It is not arguing. It is simply listening, amassing terabytes of data, scanning the radio noise around 3i Atlas for any pattern, any signal, any whisper of a techno-signature that could silence one side of the argument forever. So far, there is only silence. But in the immense quiet of space, even the absence of a sound can be deafening. So the natural question is, let's go. Let's launch a probe, grab a sample, and find out what this thing is made of, right? This is the dream, a mission that would eclipse Voyager, outshine Apollo. It is also, with our current technology, a complete and utter impossibility. To understand why, we must step into the mind of an orbital mechanic. This is not a world of wishful thinking. It is a universe governed by the unforgiving mathematics of velocity and gravity. Adam Hibbard, an engineer working with the Initiative for Interstellar Studies, ran the numbers. He used software that plots what's called a pork chop plot, a map of launch windows and energy requirements. The results were a splash of cold water. The plot for a mission to 3i Atlas is a grim field of red and yellow, the colors of prohibitive energy. The key metric is called C3, the characteristic energy required to escape Earth's gravitational grasp and enter a specific trajectory. A mission to Mars requires a C3 of about 15 kilometers per second squared. A mission to catch 3i Atlas would require a C3 well over 100. We simply do not possess a rocket or a propulsion technology capable of delivering that kind of punch. Could we be clever? Could we use the gravity of the planets as a slingshot? A jupiter oberth maneuver, diving deep into the gas giant's gravity well to fire our engines at maximum efficiency, is the most powerful tool in our celestial navigation kit. It still isn't enough. The numbers don't lie. The velocity gap is too wide. What about a solar Oberth maneuver? A suicidal dive toward the sun, using its immense gravity to whip us around and accelerate to unheard of speeds. The next window for such a trajectory was September 26th of this year. The time required to design, approve, build, and launch a spacecraft of such complexity and resilience means that window slammed shut before the ink was even dry on the discovery paper. The next potential window isn't until 2038. By then, 3i Atlas will be over twice the distance of Neptune from the Sun, its signal fading into the imperceptible background noise of the cosmos. This is the cruel, poetic irony of interstellar interlopers. They offer us a front-row seat to the greatest show in the galaxy, but they perform on a stage that moves at a velocity we can only dream of. We are shore-bound sailors, watching a magnificent, unknown ship sail past at impossible speed destined for ports we can only dream of. We can look, we can study, but we cannot touch. This impotence is a humbling reminder of our place in the cosmos. We have mastered our planet. 
We have touched our moon. We have sent robots to our neighboring worlds. But the gap between interplanetary and interstellar is not a step. It is a chasm of exponential difficulty. Projects like Lyra, which study the feasibility of such missions, are not wasted effort. They are the essential first steps to closing that gap. They are the blueprints for a future generation that might not let the next visitor slip away. But for now, for this visitor, we are relegated to the role of spectators. So, what remains? If we could not catch it, and if the debate about its true nature may never be settled, what is the point? What is its legacy? The answer is that its gift was not a destination, but a direction. Its value was not in the rock itself, but in the mirror it held up to us. Its origin is perhaps its most poetic feature. Its path suggests it came from the Milky Way's thick disk, a region of ancient stars that could be billions of years older than our sun. This comet could be older than our entire solar system. It's a relic from a time before Earth even existed, a frozen piece of history from a stellar nursery we may never see. Scientifically, it was a priceless sample, delivered free of charge. Its coma, its outgassing, its light, these were data points from a factory we will never visit. Its chemical composition is a recipe written around another star. It proves that the basic building blocks of life, water, carbon, organic molecules, are not unique to our solar system. They are universal ingredients, scattered across the galaxy. This single object did more to advance the field of comparative planetology than a decade of studying local asteroids. This is the real treasure. Not alien technology, but alien chemistry. Each interstellar object is a free sample delivered to our cosmic doorstep of how other planetary systems are built. As researcher Wes Fraser put it, each one is a little piece of low-hanging fruit from a tree that can tell us a great deal about the trees growing in some other neighborhood. Technologically, it was a brutal and necessary reality check. It exposed the stark limitation of our reach. It lit a fire under our engineering ambitions. But its greatest legacy is philosophical. It has forever shattered the illusion of our isolation. The galaxy is not static and empty. It is dynamic, messy, and full of wandering worlds. Our solar system is not a closed room. The windows are open, and the wind from the galactic ocean is blowing in. Three-Eye Atlas is the third pebble to land on our roof, proving the hailstorm is real. The Vera C. Rubin Observatory is coming online. It will scan the entire sky every few nights. Astronomers now believe we could start finding such interstellar visitors not once a decade, but once a year, or even more. The age of interstellar astronomy has begun. 3 Eye Atlas was not an anomaly. It was a herald, the first drops of rain before the storm. As this silent teacher departs, it leaves us with a final haunting lesson. We are not alone in the universe, but the question has shifted. It is no longer, are we alone? The new question, the profound and terrifying question that 3 Eye Atlas imprinted on our collective consciousness is, what else is out there? And what will come through that open window next? The future isn't written, it's visiting, and it's just getting started. <laughs>